Shalom Chavim. We're going to look at the book of Esther today. And I have a feeling that after you hear this message on Esther, you may never look at this story the same as you have in the past. Uh, some interesting things that I believe the Lord has dealt with me on, on this story, things that I've never thought about before when looking at Esther. And I, I've really been feeling compelled to go back and read the story of Esther and after reading it and prayerfully just going through it over and over, um, I have just been amazed at what God has uh, unraveled here for me, for my brethren and sisters of the Jewish faith, and very importantly, those of the Christian faith. Um, you're going to see things and hear things uh, this, this day here that um, I hope will certainly be a blessing to you and may also cause you to recognize what you are called for as a uh, Christian believer. Uh, we're going to see a lot of things in this story and uh, it, it should give us a lot of appreciation for the stand that we have with Israel uh, as well as we go through this story here. Um, before I get into it though, let me just mention briefly for you uh, those of you that have been waiting, especially in foreign nations, that it's been ex uh, too expensive for you to be able to get the book Yam Suf, it is now available in ebook. Uh, you can get that on our website at israelreturns.com or um, you can go to, I believe, amazon.com carries it as well. It's very inexpensive. It's only $4.99 if I'm, uh, I believe that's right on that. And, uh, and secondly, uh, we are still planning to go to Israel here this uh, coming September. And I, I, quite frankly, I don't know how that's going to happen. I just believe in my heart this is, it's getting close to that time. And I can't say for sure that this is the year that the Lord has in mind for us, but I'm just kind of prayerfully seeking His, his guidance on that and uh, in, in the way in which He will make for that as well. Um, uh, I want to thank you also for those of you that have that have been so kind to contribute to the ministry. Uh, it's it is you know we would love to have it to where I could spend all my time here uh, with you and talking to you about these things. Oh, and one other one other thing uh, I'd love to mention to you: there is an Israeli sister that's been watching the videos here. I won't call her name, but uh, she is is born born in Israel, lived there most of her life, lives in the United States now. Uh, who will be helping us with the translation of Yam Suf? Now, when I say the translation of Yam Suf, we are looking at possibly taking the last chapter and um, uh, maybe making a book in that in itself, uh, something to be a little bit shorter, but adding to some of the depth that God has revealed to me since then for the redemption of Israel. And I think that we may entitle that book, What Would Moses Say? Uh, I say that not that I'm Moses by no means, I'm just your brother. Uh, but my point in saying it that way is to kind of get my people to understand if Moses was here himself, what would he say concerning the prophetic events that are happening in the world today? And so I want to take it from Torah, uh, take it from an approach from the Torah for, for the Jewish people to look at the fulfillment of prophecies in the day that we're living in. And we're fixing to see a lot more of that here in just a few minutes here. So let's get right into this message here. In the book of Esther, uh, I'll be using a Christian Bible for the sake of English. Uh, I don't know what I did with, uh, I had a Tanakh and I was traveling and I, I don't know if I left it somewhere or not. I mean, I have Torah things like that here, but those are in Hebrew and it would be difficult for the Christian people or English speaking people to understand that. Um, and we may not get through all of Esther either in this. There is so much in here that's just beautiful. But we, we find that it says now uh, in verse chapter 1, verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, um, this is Ahasuerus, which reigneth from India even into Ethiopia over uh, 107 and 20 provinces, 127 provinces. He basically was like the king of the world at that time. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was uh, in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all the princes and his servants, um, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces 
uh, being before him, when he shewed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even in 140 and four, 40, excuse me, four score days, 140 days, in other words, when these were to be the expired. Now, so we just kind of we get a little picture here, get started up here. They're having a, 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 a celebration of his um, of, of you know what he's doing here. Now, what I find interesting. Even the rabbis comment that the divine name of God is not mentioned here in the story of Esther. And I think there's a reason behind that as well. Uh, bear with me when I say this. I believe that the king here is in, 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 a, uh, in a type, we would say, is typing God himself uh, in this story. And you're going to see why as we go along here, uh, because we find, like, for example, Vashti, who is married to uh, the king at the time, she's the queen, she's married to him, and I believe that Vashti is a type of Israel. Now, this is going to help especially some of those that have the idea that, uh, that uh, Yeshua is the bride or the bridegroom of the Christian and and Yehovah uh, 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 is the, or, or Hashem is the bridegroom to the Jews. It's not the case. It's one bridegroom, and that bridegroom is God Himself, but we find that He can manifest Himself, make Himself known to His people in different, different ways. Um, uh, you know, which is kind of interesting, I believe it's Isaiah 63. And I don't want to get into this teaching so much on this, but uh, um, just to kind of give you a little clue on that, and it's always a little confusing when I'm using a Christian Bible. I've got, you know, with a Tanakh, I know exactly where to go, but the layout is a little different in the Christian Bible here. Um, and that is actually in yeah, Isaiah 63, 19. I just want to show you something here. Uh, because, and, and we are actually going to touch a little bit more on the subject of the identity of God through the story of Esther because it brings it out so beautifully. Um, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, it says, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Now this is actually speaking of Hashem. This is Yahweh, Yahweh. Okay, he is, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. He feels it. He understands their pains, the children of Israel. And the angel of his presence. See, that's the key right there. What was the angel of his presence? It's the pillar of fire. It's the Shekinah. It's what God took on in order to be able to make himself known to his people. It was the Shekinah glory. And then we find that um, the same when Moses met God at the burning bush. It says that the angel of the Lord. There was no man standing there in a, in a, in a you know, Moses doesn't write about anything of a, of a, of a, uh, of, of a man dressed in white or something like that, what we would think with wings on. He speaks, uh, you know, he writes about the angel, the presence of the angel of the Lord, but then it was Yahweh, Yahweh, Hashem speaks from the midst of that burning bush, the midst of the fire itself. So what is that? The angel of his presence, as Isaiah 63 says here, is the pillar of fire. It is the form in which God is making himself known to the world. That's why the Christian Bible writes about Yeshua as being that, that, that the fullness of God dwelt in him reconciling or making known the world to himself. You know, he's just hidden in different ways. It's the same way it was when Abraham, when the one that came to Abraham, there were three that came down. And some say, well, that's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, that's not. That's, that's paganism. It's not like that. God's not like that. He's one God. Deuteronomy. Shema uh, Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Um, but anyway, that's, like I said, it's a really a different teaching altogether. But we will actually touch into that here. So let's, let's start beginning into Esther here. Let's go to uh, uh, chapter 1. Let's get, start in verse 7 here. And they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drink was according uh, to the law. None did compel 
For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Now, that verse itself is amazing to me because it represents revelation. Wine is a stimulant, and the older wine gets, the stronger it gets. It's a stimulation of revelation. Okay, now you're going to see things, and you may differ with me, and that's all right, brother, sister, whoever you may be, but uh, just kind of bear with me on this. But everything here is only a pattern of what would happen, not only past, but future. You know, I had a question the other day about the book of Revelation in the Christian Bible. Did I believe that that was chronological order? No, I do not. You can see the past, present, and future in that book. It's very interesting, and it's not laid out in chronology either. That's what's interesting. But here we find here that this is, and the drinking was according to the law, none did compel. God don't, you know, he's not going to force himself on you. You know, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. As much as you want to believe, much as you want to receive the revelation of who God really is, God will give you. There's no forcing. Then notice here, verse 9. Also Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house which belongeth to the king, Ahasuerus. See? She was reigning and ruling in Israel before the destruction of 70 A.D. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was married with wine, he commanded... Uh, uh, these are written in English. As well. I'm not looking at this from the Torah, so forgive me if I don't pronounce it right with these translations. I don't even think it's transliterations. Mehuman, Bistha, Chorbana, Bigtha, and Abagatha, and Zethar, and Karkas, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Harasas the king. Now, I made myself a note. There's seven chamberlains and then there's seven princes. And uh, I find it interesting because I wonder if, for example, the seven princes or, or the, you know, is this possibly where it speaks of the seven spirits of God or the seven golden candlesticks that are, that are mentioned in Zechariah, uh, Revelation in the Christian Bible speaks of the seven golden candlesticks as well. And it speaks about how that they were, uh, they were anointed of God. Um, just an interesting thought. I don't, I don't really know, but I just kind of wondered about that. To, uh, so anyway, the, 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 the chamberlains, they were there, there in the presence of the king, says to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, so she, to show the people and the princess her beauty, so she was, uh, for she was fair to look upon. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. When Israel, who is the bride of God himself, when he came in the form of Yeshua in a human body, she was summoned to come to be his bride, to take her place with her husband. And she refused. This in itself ought to begin to make us recognize who Yeshua really was and who he is. She refused to be. She refused to come out at the king's command. And so did Israel. Israel refused to. Now, it's not to say all Israel did because all Israel did not refuse. There were Jews that did believe him to be Moshiach. But she represents Israel as a whole of that day. I, I say as a whole, keep in mind, at the time that Yeshua came, there were only the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin and the Levites. The house of Israel was not there, so she does not represent the house of Israel in that per perspective, I would think. Uh, but anyway, so, so she refused to come out uh, to him, and the king was angry. So then the king said to his wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner now, now that's, that was another interesting passage that I read there, right there. When he said to the wise men, 
let let that soak in for you there boy that's that's an interesting one there um then the king said to the wise men which knew the times what came to to yeshua jesus when he was just uh, about a two-year-old boy the wise men where did they come from this is interesting now because remember uh, Ahasuerus here is the king of Persia and, and over Media. And where did the wise men come from? They came from the east. Mm. Kind of interesting to think of these things. Which knew the times, and they did. They knew when Yeshua was to be born and when he was going to call Vashti, Israel, to her place. It was time for her to put on the royal apparel and to become part, to, to come and stand with her, with, her, with her lover, her God. To come with Yahweh, to be standing there as a bride adorned in her uh, royal apparel. And the wise men knew that. But Vashti did not recognize her place. So he consults with them here. He, he, and for, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And they did. They studied under Daniel, so they knew the laws of God. And the next unto him was uh, Kershina, Shetha, uh, Adamatha, um, Mimikon, and the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which set the first in the kingdom. So, let's see here. We have Karshanatha, Shethar, Adamatha, Tarshish, Marizia, and, and Mersina, and Mimikin. Okay, these, these are your seven princes of, of Persia. Now, this is why I wonder if they don't represent those seven spirits of God. Um, can't say for sure, but it's just interesting to note that. What shall we do unto Queen Vashti? And, uh, hang on one second, my brothers, okay. <clears throat> what should we do to queen, to, do unto Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king, Ahasuerus, by the chamberlains. And Mimikin answered before the king and the, prince, uh, and the princess, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of uh, of the of King Ahasuerus, so she hath she she hath done wrong. See, she's she sinned against God Himself in doing the things that she did. Now, if you were to look at Ezekiel chapter thirty six, this, this is why it's 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 amazing how these things just kind of work together. But in Ezekiel thirty six, uh, this is where we find that God says here, say for example, for verse 19, and I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed throughout the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. See, they, 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 they make God's name unholy because why? Because watch what he says here. They profane my holy name when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, our Hashem, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore they say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, wherewith you went. I will sanctify that my my great name which was profaned among the heathen which you have profaned in the midst of them and in the heathen shall know that I am uh, Yahweh saith the Lord God when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes for I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land God promises to restore them back now and bear with me though, but in the dispersion, in the beginning, when God's name is profaned, just like the princes are saying here to, to Ahasuerus the king, you know, what she's done, 
is cause contempt. It's called, in other words, it profanes the name of God throughout all the nation. And that's what Israel did. Because she didn't come out when she was supposed to and recognize her God. And Mimican answered and said before the king, verse 16 here, um, and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but to also the princes and, and to all the people and all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad. We, just, we were just reading this. Sorry about that. Likewise, verse 18, Likewise shall the ladies of, the, of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. We even, even the Christian people, you've got to recognize who your Lord is. And we're going to get into that from, from looking at some of these here. Um, when, okay, so let's, let's continue on here. Verse 19. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persia, and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And this is the reason, and there's more, there's more places in the Bible that speak of this, where it talks about the fall of Israel. And how that God would be known by a people that he did not know. That his name would be exalted by them. Uh, and we know that that is written in there for, the, for he turns to the Gentiles. Okay, just to give you a little background on that. I wish I had the verses for that right now, but I, I don't write before me. I didn't write those down. And when the king decreed which he shall make, shall be published throughout all the empire, for it, it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And say, in, this, in the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mimican. For he sent letters unto all the king's provinces, and to every province according to the, to the writing thereof. And of course we know this is when Vashti then. Now notice now, I don't know if you guys realize this, Vashti is never divorced. She only loses her status as the queen of herself she's not divorced as some think in replacement theology Israel's is just put away and divorced of God we do have a place in scripture where he divorces her but then he turns right back around in the same chapter he says oh Israel I'm married unto you so she's not divorced she's only she's uh, separated from the presence of the king and that's what that is uh, let's go into chapter 2 and these things when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Now, this speaks of a future redemption for Israel as well. See, he doesn't say it yet, but it speaks of that future redemption because we notice it says, when, and when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti. So she does come back in his remembrance. He's not forgot her. He's not cast her away utterly, as some people would think. He still remembers her. But he knows, see, God's word cannot change. And that's what we find, even in, in the reading of the story here in Esther and King Ahasuerus, his words cannot be altered. Once they were written, that was final. That was it. So, but anyway, so we go on and we find out then. It says, then said the king's servants that the ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And so that's what they do. They begin to gather up virgins and stuff from around the land, from all the different provinces. And, and the king appointed of the officers of the provinces of the kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan, the palace, uh, to the house of the women, and to the custodian of, of, of Higi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things uh, for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now, this is when, now when the gospel took and it changed hands. And, um, and we see that, that 
when Israel had sinned and crucified their Messiah, their husband, they crucified him. Now, many of them believed, but, but that was still few in number compared to the number of Jews in the land at that day. He turns to the Gentiles. Even Paul, in his own epistles, he stays trying to win as many Jews to Christ as he can, getting them to recognize who their husband was. In other words, God himself had come down in a human body, and their husband was here walking on earth, and they had not recognized who he was. But there was a remnant that did believe. And so they took upon Yeshua, recognizing that it was God himself in a human body, and their husband was here among them. Uh, but when he finally comes to a place that they no longer would believe, he knew that the judgment that Jesus had already declared would come upon them. You know, Jesus even prophesied this, which we'll get into in just a, just a few moments here. But, uh, so he takes and he gathers the virgins. Now what's interesting on that, if you go to, I believe it's in Luke, or maybe it's Matthew, uh, chapter 25. Uh, let me see if I can find that real quick here. Um, let me try Matthew 25 first. It speaks about the ten virgins. And that's something else that I find very ironic in this. Because in the story of Esther, it's, it's, it's showing everything to you. Um, it's right after, oh wow, this is fascinating here. Um, Jesus also, well in chapter 25, he prophesies of the uh, of there not being one stone left upon another. And this is when he's going to prophesy of Israel uh, in their fall. Um, but the ten virgins, let's see, when you therefore shall see the abomination, oh gosh. Uh, maybe it's further back. I forget exactly where, oh here we go. And uh, oh, I was looking in the wrong chapter, I was looking at chapter 24. Chapter 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which, which took uh, their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamp and took no oil with them, but the, but the wise took all in their vessels with their lamps. Now, you keep in mind, of course, with God, just like with King Ahasuerus here, he has more than one wife, but when he actually chooses one particular to be the queen, that's the representation of the five wise virgins that have the oil in their lamp. Uh, it, it is a representation of the bride herself, is what this speaks of. Uh, so I find it interesting that he gathers up all these virgins. In other words, this are the, this are the, 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 not only the Jews that were believing, but it was also speaking of the Gentiles that came in and, and that believed Jesus Christ to be Mashiach. They believed him to be the Messiah. And they, became, they were virgins coming in, down through the ages, virgins coming in. But the thing is, is even though they're all virgins, and they all are willing to come before the king, he's only going to choose one to be his bride, to be the queen, in other words. And that is fascinating. And it thundered outside. I don't know if the video caught that. That was interesting. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of uh, Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. I wonder how many of you guys catch that one right there. He's a Benjamite. Uh, remember when I spoke to you a little while back and everything about Joseph, the story of Joseph being a type of, of Yeshua, but yet Joseph, uh, when he was uh, condemned of his brother and thrown in the pit, they hated him because the, he was a spiritual boy and he had visions and dreams and, and all these things that would happen, so they figured they'd get rid of him. Same thing with Yeshua. But he goes down into Egypt. Even Yeshua went down into Egypt. That's kind of ironic. Of course, a lot of people know that. Um, but the thing that I always found fascinating when right before Joseph reveals himself to his brethren, now they all are pardoned for what they did to him. Just like Yeshua on the cross, he pardoned them. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They were all pardoned. But before he reveals himself to him, or to them, when they're headed back and he finally gets to see Benjamin, which Mordecai represents Benjamin, the Jews of the day we're living in now. 
he puts his cup into his bag, has his servant chase him down, overtake him, and said, why did you do such evil unto them, to your master? And he said, you've stolen his cup. And of course, they all begin to weep and mourn, thinking, you know, what are you talking about? What do we do? And he started with the eldest until he got to the youngest, the servant did. He, he knew who every one of them were. He knew all about them. Don't think that Yeshua doesn't know all about you, my brothers. He does. And he got to Benjamin, and when he opened it up, the cup was in his bag. That was a sign to our people, brothers, that Benjamin, the one brother that was not guilty of anything when it came to Joseph, he's found holding the cup which represented none other than the last communion that Jesus had, Yeshua, on earth. And he was rejected by a Jew. He, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot, he was rejected by a Jew that sold him out. But yet, we weren't there. My family, my father's, my mother's side, my father's side, none of them were there. They weren't a part of the crucifixion of Yeshua. But we're found holding that cup in our hand. We are the Benjamites of today. That's the typology, I guess you would call in that there. We, we are Benjamin, the, the innocent one to his death, but yet we're found with the cup in our bag. And we have to make the decision what will we do with this cup? So anyway, so Mordecai is a Benjamin, and so he represents the Jews that are today and the Jews around the world. He is a representation for them. Uh, so he said he'd been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with uh, uh, Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away. And he brought up uh, Hadass, Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother. Uh, the maiden, uh, excuse me, the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father had, uh, excuse me, when, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So God bless him for what he did there. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, the custody of uh, Haggai, uh, Esther, was brought also into the king's house into the custody of, of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him. She obtained kindness of him and speedily gave her things for purification. Now, this is the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and there again, it's a type of that. But don't look at it as a separate being just because it's not the king. It's that anointing. See, God can take His own spirit and, and, and break it up and pour, pour it over each and every one of us. The Ruach HaKadosh can live and eat inside of each one of us. And it's, and it's there it's when you find favor with God, He allows His Spirit to come upon you. For what? Pleased Him, and, and she obtained kindness of Him, and He speedily gave her such things for purification with such things as belonged to her. That's fascinating. These gifts belong to you as the bride of Yeshua. They're given unto you for the purpose, for purification, for sanctification, for getting you ready to go in the presence of your God. Which, which such things as belongs to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. See, the bride, of, the bride of Yeshua finds favor in the presence of God. And he sends, just like Eliezer was sent down to get the beautiful Rebekah for Isaac. 
She found favor. He brought gifts. He's a type of the Holy Ghost. Eliezer was a type of the Holy Spirit going down, looking for the bride that her Lord would be pleased with. And when he found her, she found favor in his sight. Rebecca did. And he gave gifts. And I, I, I can't say for sure, but when I saw the seven maidens with her, I wondered, and, and this is just speculation on my part, but uh, I've mentioned to you before, the seven um, church ages that are written, or the churches that are written in, um, in Revelation, which even as Chuck Missler points out, hermeneutically speaking, they speak of the church down through the ages. Could that be the, re the redeemed uh, uh, saints of God from the early ages, from Paul's age, being raised up with her to go up as part of that bride? Now, that's, I don't know. Just a, an interesting thought when I saw that. I uh, can't say that that's right or not. It's just a, just a little thought there. Uh, but anyway, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. That's another interesting thing. She didn't reveal who she really was. And believe me, there are Jews that are part of that bride even today. So, And uh, Mordecai walked every day before the court of, uh, uh, of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Don't think that the Jewish people are not watching the Christians. They're curious to see if this rapture is really going to happen or not. Now, when every man's maid turn was come to go into the king of Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months according to the manner of the women, for so was the days of their purification accomplished to wit six months with oil and myrrh and six months with sweet odors and the other things for their purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. And the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of uh, Shaashkaz, uh, the king's chamberlain, which, which kept the concubines. She came in 